fraud. And what it is is we don't want to be totally aggressive with certain people, but we want to kind of slowly ease into what we want to do. Yeah. Well, I, I had a thought that there's, you know, <laughs> there's boiling the fool. And what it is is we can sometimes in our lives behave foolishly. And we can handle circumstances foolishly. And not to say that we're a, an incompetent fool or anything, but you know what? We have an adversary that walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he is out to kill each and every one of us. Right? And we've seen people fall. But he's not going to come at us just guns blazing. He is going to come at us slowly and try to get us to fall. And so tonight, that's, that's what we're going to talk about, you know, and I, I thought I had another message about uh, waiting on God and having patience, but I want to speak more about time in, in this sense. And we're going to start out in the book of Romans. This is familiar scriptures, and this one came to me tonight, and we're just going to add it. Before we start, and we're going to read Romans, let's see which verse we want to start, verse 11 through 14, but before we start, you know, we talk a lot about Jesus' name, right? And, and none of us believe that Jesus' name is good, but you know when that started, it probably started an everyday conversation. Oh, we baptize in Jesus' name and with an apostrophe. And people probably swallowed it at that point in time and said, well, that's okay, because as long as we say it right now in conversation, that's okay. But when we go to baptism, we're going to actually do it in the name of Jesus Christ. But then over time, people accepted it more and more and became okay with it. Now it's a full-fledged theology that every, like every other doctrine is agreeing on. And that's it's scary, because it's so palatable, and people love it. It just flows off the tip of your tongue. But it was a slow boil to where people were tricked into accepting that. And you know what? <laughs> Just while I'm on different topics, homosexuality in our country, it's people want us to accept it and embrace it. Not just accept it, but full on embrace it. But I look back, and I'm not very old, but I can look back and see that over time, people have been brainwashed. And they boiled the frog in that regard, too, because it started out as just an oddity, and it was comical. I think of movies like, you know, Mrs. Doubtfire, where there was cross-dressing and stuff like that, and I'm not uh, trying to single anybody out or anything, but they put the funny gay person in there. And I'm just being real with us tonight. They put the funny gay person, and then it became, oh, it's funny, so it's not bad. It's easy to tolerate if it's funny, if it's got a joke attached to it. But gradually, gradually, look how society has flipped. 30 years ago, the overwhelming majority of Americans would be against gay marriage. They would think it was wrong. Now, it literally is over 50%, which is by definition a majority. Same with abortion. When I was growing up, abortion was a bad word. And that wasn't that long ago. But now, it's crazy if you don't think abortion is okay boiled the frog. It was a slow transition, slow transition to where these seeds got planted and they gradually grew. We need to make sure that we don't fall prey to slow boils and end up out of church, out of the will of God. This is relevant for every single one of us. Romans chapter 13 and verse 11 says, and that knowing the time." knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep when you're falling asleep it's much like that slow boil when you're falling asleep unless you're me you don't just sit down and then you're gone now I'm the exception to that rule if I sit on a couch I'm out no but it takes some time you you they say you wind down right you fall asleep. You count some sheep. You do certain things. Maybe have some warm milk. I don't know what people who don't have my problem do, but it's a slow, gradual thing when you're actually falling asleep at night, right? We all have a routine, and then we slowly fall asleep, right? There's not a point where you're like, I'm literally in a half a second going to be asleep, 
right? That's not how it works. If you do think about it, like sometimes I will, man, I've got to be up in three and a half hours. I've got to be up in three hours and 19 minutes. I've got to be up in three hours and seven minutes, right? And then if you're thinking about the time, if you're thinking about falling asleep, it's not going to happen very likely, right? So it's a gradual, slow thing. So right here it says, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Sometimes we don't realize in our walk with God that we're falling asleep spiritually. And the word of God is saying right now that we need to awake out of that. You know, when you're driving and you're tired at night and gradually you don't even realize it, that you'll start to be like, whoa, where did that, se I'm being serious, where did that section of road go? And then you'll, you'll have the shakes or whatever to, to come to. You got to roll the window down, get some cold air in there, you know, turn the music up a little bit louder to keep yourself awake. But my point is that you don't realize that you're falling asleep until you wake up, right? You don't realize, wow, I'm asleep now. No, that's, that's not how it works. But right now, spiritually speaking, there could be some that are falling asleep and it is high time to awake out of that sleep. Why? For now, now is our salvation. How many is grateful for your salvation tonight? But we haven't even tasted of it yet. We haven't tasted the real joy that we're going to experience from our salvation when we can see those streets of gold, when we can finally meet our Savior. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Now, what is that saying? That's saying that they did believe, right? They believed. And now their salvation is nearer. But he's telling them that they need to awake out of sleep. He's not talking to people who are never in church. He's talking to ones who believed, who have salvation. Because otherwise he wouldn't be able to say, now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. So watch for this. Watch for the signs that you're starting to fall asleep. I don't know who this is for. Maybe it's for nobody, but I don't think so. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. It's here. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Cast off the works of darkness. Let us walk honestly. Let us walk honestly as in the day. It's hard to get away with, with walking in a sneaky fashion in the day. If you're trying to tiptoe in the shadows and it's broad daylight, you just look foolish. Well, right now, it's day. The day is at hand. Amen. The night is far spent, it says. We need to make sure that we're not falling asleep. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. I always think of Chinese restaurants when I think of that word wantonness, because I used to call it wantonness. But I guess that's not the way you pronounce it. There's a little joke about me tonight. But... Not in rioting and drunkenness. And I think about drunkenness. Drunkenness does not have to be on alcohol. All right. Drunkenness can be on the things of the world. Drunkenness can be on your phone. Did you know that? That, the, that your phone can blind you to what is going on. If you don't believe me, I don't want you to do this. But if you didn't believe me, drive while looking at your phone the entire time and see how far you get. Not very far. I believe about 14 years ago, I was involved in a car accident where I was looking at my phone. And I may as well have been drunk. But the things on our phone, I, you know what? And I'm not bashful about saying it. I hate TikTok. I hate it. I hate the short form videos. You know, people say, and like, I'm not judging anybody, but it can be used as a tool of the devil. It can be. I'm not saying that it is. But if you sit there for three hours just watching video after video after video, that's not of God, because what are you not doing at that point in time? Right? Are you praying when you're sitting there scrolling mindlessly? And you know what? I've caught myself, because I'll, I'll be on the Facebook ones, and it, 45 minutes is gone. I'm like, what was I just doing? It's a tool. Of, so you could be drunk on things of the world. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. 
strife and envying. Strife, strife and envying. I'm just going to leave those there. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts. Multiple, multiple things that this flesh desires. Right? In this life, there are multiple avenues where we are. It says, no man is tempted of God, but every man is, what is it? How does it phrase? I just had it and I lost it. I'm not, even, I'm not going to waste your time. But every man is drawn away of his own, own lust and enticed. It's, it's this flesh is, is sinful. Yeah. And we need to make sure that we don't make provisions for it to follow after the things of this world. If you catch yourself... <laughs> I don't know why I'm talking about this tonight, but if you catch yourself on your phone scrolling, put the phone, you know, you know, you can put it down. You can put it down. It will be okay. Brother Mark, I know that you're probably a major at fault of this. You probably just sit on your phone all day at work, right? No, I'm just teasing. You can put your phone down and you'll be okay. He's probably the least likely to actually be doing that. Anyway. We got to make sure that we watch and we don't fall asleep. This is a serious thing. Acts chapter 13. Yeah, I actually wrote this down on October 14th. So this one has been, been simmering for a while. Kind of like the boiled frog. Poor frog. Why would you boil a frog? It didn't do anything. Acts chapter 13, I believe around verse 44. Let's go to 42 just to put it in context. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Persuaded, they had to be persuaded to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Man, that would be great. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. They were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So I've been, I was talking to someone about baptism, and this person is in a different uh, doctrine, uh, a false doctrine, and that has a form of godliness but denies the power thereof. And I was telling this person, they don't believe that baptism is necessary. And I brought up Mark 16 and 15 and 16, where it talks about he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And this person uh, waited about a week and they were, you know, stud they said that they would study on. And I gave several other scriptures, but this was the one that they decided to answer on. And... Um, they got back with me and they said, well, yeah, I watched a ton of uh, videos and I checked into the commentaries. And what I think is that the second part of it where it says, and is baptized shall be saved, that's not actually uh, relevant. It's just the belief portion. And you could put something as trivial as eating cake in there. And he that believeth and is eating, I'm not joking. And this is, an, this is a college educated individual. This is supposed to be someone who's intelligent. They said, it's, so you could say he that believeth and eateth cake shall be saved because they believe they they're so indoctrinated that they have a bias in their mind of how can I say that baptism is not necessary that was a boiled frog because when this gospel was first preached we looked throughout the Bible where they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and I asked this person and I'm waiting for a response but I said if it's so arbitrary to just say that, oh, it could be just they're eating cake as well, why would God put it in the Bible? <laughs> why would it be written that he that, is that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved? So I want to say all that to say we can look at that tonight and say, wow, that is foolish. 
But you know what? We are just this far from ignoring God and what he's saying to us that we could be in that same boat to where we believe a lie. None of us are immune from that. I'm just being real tonight, right? If we don't retain God in our knowledge, he can turn us over to a reprobate mind. And none of us want that. Because that is, imagine if right now you're sitting in the church of Jesus Christ, the very one that he purchased, but a year from now you could be sitting in a false doctrine and not even realize it. That's scary to me. That is scary to me. This is a serious thing that we cannot, cannot fall asleep spiritually. Pray that I have words that, and God, you know, I can't open anybody's eyes, but God can. It says, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But listen to this. But seeing ye, it was necessary that you had to hear this first. But seeing ye put it from you, you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. What a phrase. You judge yourself unworthy of eter- everlasting life. Wow. <laughs> when they rejected the preaching of the word, they were saying that I don't want everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. What about the five virgins who slept instead of making sure that they had the oil that they needed? We need to make sure that we don't fall asleep, that we are prepared. Because literally, this is the last time. Right now, we are living in the last time. We need to make sure that we have that oil, that we're prayed up, that we're full of the Holy Ghost. Not asleep. The next time, I, I, this, this is a great verse. This is a great Bible. This Bible is awesome. I love this word. But this, Acts chapter 13 and 46, is a good verse that if you ever feel like, you know, Brother Randall was talking about it this morning, that some people just say, well, I'm going to go to hell. That's it. like he said this morning. I'm not trying to piggyback off his message, but that is insane. That is insane. That's like saying, yeah, cut my hand off. That'd be great. It's just foolish. You don't know what you're saying. But if if the devil comes tempting you, or if your mind starts to fall asleep, go back to this scripture and say, do I want to judge myself unworthy of everlasting life? I don't want everlasting life. I don't want it. I don't want it. And say it out loud so you can hear it. Because you can push a thought away. But when you say it out loud, But you know what? No, that's not how the devil is going to come after any one of us. He wants it to be a slow boil to where, I've heard this said, that when you get out of church, that was not the day that you really got out of church. How many knows that that is true? So you are sleeping, and in fact, you're sleepwalking right out of the church. So you got to make sure that you recognize the signs, and you wake up before it's too late. So say it out loud. I am not going to judge myself unworthy of everlasting life. I'm laying hold on everlasting life. That is my promise that God made me, and I'm not giving it up. I'm not letting go of it. We got to purpose that in our hearts and say it. Make it clear to that devil that I'm not getting at this one. Ezekiel, chapter 33, chapter 33, let's start, I don't have a ton of scriptures tonight, we got some time, let's start verse 1, give some context. 
I'm not going to go for three hours. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchmen, for their watchmen, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. I believe that, you know what, I'm not saying because I'm special or anything, but I believe that the word of God can sound a trumpet even today and try to wake people up, if they will let it. But you know what, you could snooze your alarm clock so many times that, you know what, I have my iPhone as an alarm. Sometimes I snooze it so many times, I'll wake up three hours later because the alarm clock gave up. It'll stop after a certain point. You could snooze it too much. You know what? In a spiritual sense, you can snooze on God so much that it stops even drawing you. That's a scary situation to be in because it's not just, oh, I woke up at eight instead of six. No, you missed the boat. You missed out on everlasting life. None of us want that tonight. So we ought to make sure that we are wide awake. He blow the trumpet and warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet, do you hear it tonight? And taketh not warning. If the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. That's your responsibility. That was your fault. You could have heard it. You could have heeded the warning and fixed whatever needed to be fixed, but you didn't. That's not God's fault. That's not any of our fault. That's not the one who made you angry's fault. That's not the one who hurt you's fault. That is your own responsibility. Said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. It's between Brother Clarence and God. It's between me and God. It's between Brother Matt and God. It's between Sister Katie and God. None of us have excuse. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. It says in that, those verses that I was talking about earlier. But with every temptation, he will make a way of escape. He will be right there when you need him to deliver you from whatever you need him to deliver you from. Anybody else know that to be true tonight? He will. He'll be right there when we need him. Thank God for that. He will never leave us nor forsake us. We know those scriptures. We hear them all the time. But when you finally see it in action, that you're about to fall and God reaches out and pulls you up. What a feeling. And we can thank God for that. Let's read on. He, shall, he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. The very one who started this Jesus name doctrine. He's going to have a lot of blood on his hands. The ones who have started these big theologies out here, they're going to have blood on their hands. How dare you lull someone to sleep and say they don't need to be baptized or that it doesn't need to be in the name of Jesus Christ? How dare you do that? You are, oh man, blood is on their hands. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. What a big responsibility. Therefore, thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them, warn them from me. You warn someone when there's something that's coming on them that's dangerous, that's going to hurt them, that's going to kill them. Now, tonight, the Word of God is warning someone that there is something that's going to be coming upon you, and you better not be asleep. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, 
That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. I don't want anybody else's blood required at my hand tonight. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. I don't want either one of those to be the outcome. I don't want God to deliver a warning through his word and I not say it. But I also don't want me to say it and then someone to not take heed and then to die anyway. I don't want either one of those to happen. But listen to this. Therefore, O son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. Thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God. This is another good scripture. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God created you. He does not want you to die lost. He wants to be in communion with you. Brother Tyler mentioned it. He wants to do these things for us. But more than anything, he wants us to inherit eternal life. He wants us to make heaven our home. He's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. I have, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Why not turn and live? Why not wake up out of sleep? Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why, why, why will ye die, O house of Israel? Why? When you lay it out in clear terms, that right now it's Sunday night, things seem pretty clear. The word of God is not confusing in what we're talking about. But what about Wednesday evening? What about tomorrow when you're at work? Is it going to be as clear if we don't keep it in the front of our mind? But let's lay it out right now. What would make this logical? Why will ye die, O house of Israel? What would be a good answer to that? Is there a good reason to just die for these people? God's warning them. God's wanting them to turn back to him. What possibly could they say, oh, yeah, that's a good reason to die? None. So in your life, what could possibly be a good reason to say, yeah, I'm just going to fall asleep. God's calling unto me, but I'm not going to heed the warning. I'm just going to fall asleep. I'm going to snooze the alarm. I'm going to throw the alarm clock out. That's what you do when you stop praying, when you stop reading your word, when you stop doing the things of God. You're throwing the alarm clock right out the window. You think you're going to wake up? Why will ye die, O house of Israel? I'm not going to go there, but Jeremiah 8 and 20 says, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. That's a scary scripture. On the last day, I am not saved. Let's go to the book of Joel. Chapter 3, verse 13. Put ye in the sickle, put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Brother Randall spoke about the harvest this morning. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision what are you going to do when you yourself are in the valley of decision it's not up to us the time when God calls us do you know that 
Saul didn't get parchment delivered to him at that point in time saying, Saul, are you at a point in your life where, where you could come to the Lord? Are things okay? Things cool? Do you think that you could come to God right now? No. What happened? God rocked his world. <laughs> he, he took away his sight. And it was at that point in time, not a point in time that Saul dictated, that he had to make the decision. And you and all of us, we can't wait for a convenient season. I can't remember who just preached on that recently. But someone, you know, the, the convenient season, I believe it was Agrippa. We can't wait for a convenient season. When God deals with you, that is the time. He said it's high time to wake out of sleep. So, if we're faced with the decision tonight, that is the time where God's expecting you to make that decision. A not right now is not a good idea. Because you're not promised that God's going to deal with you again. That goes for every single one of us. Every one of us. And this is serious. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. That day is coming. It's all going to be over. Nothing down here is going to matter. But where your soul is with the Lord. Nothing. Your job won't matter. Your family, as hard as this may be to swallow, your family at that day will not matter. The only thing that will, what's in your bank account won't matter. The car that you're driving will not matter. What you ate for dinner will not matter. Whether you took your vitamins or not won't matter. The only thing that will matter is what state your soul is in with the Lord. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Verse eight, <clears throat> reading down for a bit. And then shall that wicked that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. 2 Thessalonians 2, is that where I am? 2 Thessalonians 2 and 8, with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power, listen to this. If you don't think that you will be deceived, think again. You need to make sure that you are living in the word of God, led full of the Holy Ghost. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs. So many people look for signs. People are superstitious. They look after signs. Well, this wicked one is going to provide those signs. And lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Do you love the truth? Do you really? Many here tonight were born into the truth. Many were not. But we need to love the truth. We need to appreciate the revelation that God has given us tonight. And for this cause, because they did not love the truth, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. If you ever hear someone, you know, I'm not trying to be mean at all. I'm really not. But we spent some time in the Alzheimer's unit when we went to the nursing home. 
and I hate Alzheimer's. I hate dementia. It's sad, it, and I mean that. It is terrible. However, someone can be talking to you and they can say something that's so far-fetched because in their mind, they think that that's true. They think that's what's really going on, but it's a delusion. It's not real. And at that point in time, you cannot take them out of that. You can't shake them from that. Now, let's say, how sad is that, right? Can you imagine if you were in a point where that was you spiritually? They believe everything that they're saying. I don't want that to be me. That they all might believe, be, they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure, had pleasure in unrighteousness. There is a pleasure to be had in this world. Did you know that? From the young to the old, we, there, you should know that there is a, this is not controversial, it shouldn't be, there's a good time out in the world. There's a certain time period, there's a certain amount of time where you could go get drunk and you could think that you're having a great time. It's going to feel fun. This flesh is going to be pleased. But then you're going to wake up one day and realize, well, there's, there, there's all kinds of different examples where you can have pleasure in unrighteousness just for a season. But I'll stick with what's real. <laughs> I'll stick with everlasting life over any of that. Forever's a long time. Don't fall asleep now and miss out on eternity. You know, I've heard people lose hope in this life. People can lose hope. And you could say as that, that frog that's boiling, and please don't take this as comical. But that frog that's boiling might be at that last little moment before they die from the heat that they're experiencing. And they might say that it's no use. I'm done. And they could let themselves die. Or they could say, it's really hot. I'm jumping out of this pot. And I'm going to live. You know what? As long as there's breath in your lungs, you can make it back to God. You can wake up. You can snap out of whatever it is. Why not? Why not jump out of that pot? Why, why just pine away and just say, well, I'm falling asleep. This is just the way it is. I can't. No, you can. As Brother Randall preached this morning, the Word of God told us this morning, Jesus Christ can. We can do all things through Christ who strengthen us. You can awake out of slumber, and God wants you to awake out of slumber. He wants you to get back where you need to be with Him. Don't just accept it. Just a handful, a couple more scriptures. First Timothy. Chapter four. First Timothy four. Just turn a page or two. First Timothy four and verse one says, Now now the spirit speaketh expressly it's clear right now this is clear it, the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits. Seducing spirits, if you see them, do not have horns, tails, and a pitchfork, as Brother Randall has said many times. Seducing spirits are going to, to your eyes, to your flesh, to your brain, be attractive. If they weren't, they wouldn't be seducing spirits. They wouldn't have a chance if they were ugly, right? In all actuality, they are ugly, the meat and potatoes of it, but they're going to come so alluring to you. They're going to they're gonna make sense if you're not in the Word of God. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Don't give heed to those seducing spirits that are trying to pull you away from the Lord. Don't. 
But you know what a seducing spirit also could do is try to lull you to sleep. So that you don't necessarily walk away, but you grow so cold that you are in a slumber with God. They could try. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know what? If you're on the fence, thank God that you're still on the fence and that you haven't gone fully over. If you're on the fence, come back because if you end up having your conscience seared with a hot iron, there's no coming back from that because you won't even feel bad about the things that you're doing anymore. And that is, like I said before, a scary position to be in. I don't want to be there. I, like, I just want to read one verse in Jonah. We're almost done. Bear with me. Jonah chapter 4 and 11 says, and this, this is such a powerful scripture to me, and should not I spare, this is the Lord talking, and should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more, are more than six score thousand persons, 120,000 people, that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. They couldn't even tell their right hand from the left. When you're asleep, you have no clue what's going on. Do you? No idea. So before you get to that point, God is telling us all to wake up, to make sure that we're alert, and we're following after him as close as we can. One more, Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 2. A handful of verses to read here. Let's see where we want to start. Verse 9. The Lord knoweth. <laughs> we don't serve a dumb God. He knows everything. He created us. He knows how we work. He knows how we tick, as the expression is. He knows what makes us tick. He knows what we need right when we need it, right? Do you believe that? That God knows everything about you. The Lord, but he also knows, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Temptations, plural, many, more than one. God knows how to deliver you out of that. It's up to you if you're going to take that way out. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. They don't want anybody to tell them what to do. Presumptuous are they. Self-willed. Oh man, that's so common today. That self-will. Who are you to tell me what I need to do? I'm going to do what I want to do, and you can do what you want to do. And they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But listen to this. But these, I don't want God to look at me like this. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, Speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Man. <laughs> and shall receive the reward. Ooh, there's a reward of unrighteousness. There's something waiting on you. If you live an ungodly life, there's a reward waiting on you. It's not very good. Shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. 
They're sporting themselves with their own deceivings. False things that they believe to be true. But I like that, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. You know what? You got a better chance of witnessing to someone when there's a tornado bearing down on a house. I don't mean to sound funny. But when things are good, when life is going smoothly, ah, life's great. But the sunny days end. The winter comes. <laughs> if you don't prepare for the winter when the summer is here, you're caught off guard. Because you've got to prepare before it's actually here. Right? We all know that. Don't riot in the daytime. Right now, you know what? Living in Portage, Indiana, things are not that bad. We could be living in a war zone. I'm not making light of it. We could literally be living in a war zone. There have been people literally uprooted from their home, and now there's nothing there. That's crazy. We, we are so fortunate and blessed where we are that we are still living in this country because we're safe for right now. So it would be so easy, and it is easy, and a lot of people have fallen asleep. But we cannot take it for granted just because right now I could drive to Meyer and I could buy, what's something I could buy? Chicken. I could buy some chicken at Meyer. I could go to Walmart across the street and buy chicken. I could go to Aldi and buy some chicken. I could go to Strax right over here and buy some chicken. I could go to, I don't even know what it's called, Lake Station anymore, the little grocery store on Central. I could go there and buy some chicken. There's food, there's abundance everywhere. I could go to Burger King if I'm feeling lazy. I could go to Little Caesars if I'm having a day. I could get a pizza or two and eat them all. There's plenty is what I'm saying. I could turn on the faucet and there's water. But we cannot take that for granted because it's not guaranteed. One day this world is going to wrap up and we better not be asleep when that happens. Because those things that are just on the TV that we could turn off the news because it's too much for us to think about. Those things will one day be here in our country. And where will you be with God that day? That is my whole thought tonight. We cannot let ourselves be lulled into sleep. We cannot be that fool that is boiled in the water and doesn't even realize it. God is sounding an alarm tonight, and it's up to you if you're going to heed it or not. If you're where you're going to be with God on that day. But there's hope tonight. You can make things right with him. He said, why will you die, O house of Israel? 